So um, we're in a series right now talking about community. Again, our, our story groups, which are small groups to help facilitate community, are launching next week, which we're really, really excited about. And so uh, today we're going to continue in that series talking about the importance of this. Why are we doing this? What does the scriptures have to say about this? And uh, this is an important time to be doing a series like this because we're living in the midst of an, a really incredible and unique time um, in our culture and in our generation. It seems like today people are more individualistic than ever. And the idea of like community and actually doing life with people um, seems like really strange to most of us. Like if we're completely honest to like be regularly involved and invested in people's lives, it seems like a strange idea. Most of us kind of have just private lives uh, that are isolated and we open up certain segments to certain people at certain times, but just kind of our opening our whole lives up to other people uh, seems like a very scary thing for most of us. A lot of us just change relationships very quickly when we're hurt. Uh, people change churches really quickly when they get hurt. People change jobs really quickly when they get hurt. The idea of just being like committed to a community of people, again, uh, something that most of us probably have not experienced too often in our lives. Um, I, I think about even my childhood, like look, looking at where culture is today versus my childhood and maybe a lot of your childhoods. Um, the neighborhood I grew up in was a, a very vibrant community. Like every single person in that neighborhood knew each other. Every single person in that neighborhood had relationships. My parents, had, we had seven kids and it was just open door policy. Like literally there could be just a random new kid on the block like chilling in my room when I got home and that was completely acceptable. It was just everybody comes in and out and that's how the neighborhood was, man. There was just tons of kids, tons of families. It was a genuine real community. I would just be chilling in my neighbor's house while they were gone eating Otter Pops and then the mom would come home and be like, what are you doing? I was like, we can't afford Otter Pops so I'm going to your house and she's like, okay. Like that was real. Like that's really what happened. I remember like a lot of times when uh, uh, it was just like we didn't have certain foods or like ran out of food stamps or whatever it was. My, 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 this is part of the good thing when you have so many kids. My mom would be like, okay, we're gonna make pancakes for breakfast, but we're out of eggs, we're out of milk, we're out of like all the supplies. So she would send one of my siblings, myself included, to all seven like different houses. She's like, Zav, you go to this house, see if we can borrow four eggs. Russo, go to this house, see if we can borrow two cups of milk. We'd literally like all disperse to seven of our neighbor's house and be like, hey, we kind of need this. And they were like, okay, cool. And we'd come back. I can like make a pancake feast. It was pretty amazing. Like again, the fact that that was like what a neighborhood was when I was a kid is, is, is like really strange to see where culture has gone now. The reality now is there's just been this shift in our culture today where like most people don't even know their neighbors. The thought of like sending your kids to someone's house to be like, hey, let me borrow some eggs or some milk or flour. Like honestly, none of you do that with your kids probably, right? Like I haven't even done that with my kids yet. Maybe I'll try it. Uh, so just saying, there is, been this shift even in the last 20 or 30 years where we we don't even have communities that we're a part of. Like most of us don't even know most of our neighbors. In fact, over the last three decades, there's been some research that shows that there's been a 45% decline in what's called neighboring, which is just actually having a relationship with your neighbors, inviting your neighbors over for dinner, going over to your neighbor's house and sharing a meal together. A 45% decline in the last three decades. We've also seen that this, this shift that's happened away from community um, has been, is, is visibly, seen in the architectural shift that's happened in the Western world in the last three decades as well. Homes typically, if you look before like 30 or 40 years ago, homes used to be built with a big front porch. They used to have the living room at the front of the house, big windows there. And you would sit out on your front porch so that as neighbors were walking by, you'd say, hi, you invite them over, come on the deck, have a glass of wine, come on the deck, have some lemonade, whatever it is. This was the way architecture worked here in the West 40 years ago. Front of the house is the spot to party, that's where the living room is because that's where all your neighbors are. But in the last 30 or 40 years, there's been a complete shift. Now, people don't build with big front porches, they build with big back porches. And the living room is now moved to the back of the house so that if you're walking through a neighborhood, all your neighbors could be there, but you might actually think they're all on vacation. Like you never even see them. You can't see into their house. You're like, what's going on? They're in their backyard on their big porch with these big fences. This is just where culture has moved in the last 20 or 30 years. And so again, we have seen a move in our culture away from homes that facilitate community to now homes that uh, prevent that. 
where we say, actually, I'm kind of scared of my neighbors. I'm kind of scared of community. And so community is now about escapism. It's how can I hide from my neighbors? It's about individualism. It's I don't know if I want relationships with these people. They might be crazy. They might be weird. So I'm just going to isolate and come into my own house. Privacy and individualism has become one of the top values in our, uh, in our communities rather than actually building relationships and getting to know our neighbors and building relationships in that way. And so most of our social needs now, they used to be met in actual community that we lived in. It was our home. It was our neighborhood. It was building those relationships. Now there's been a shift away from the actual home to the screen. In the modern era that we live now, as you guys all know, we are consumed with the screen. And most people now find or at least try to find their community, not with actual neighbors, but through with people who are following them on Instagram, with people who are their friends, if you would, on Facebook, through just consuming more and more entertainment on Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, YouTube, and all those things, right? Like we have, we have a million of them. Even the shift that we've seen, I mean, this has happened probably 10 or 15 years ago, but even more so after COVID with saying, hey, you know, even church, church community coming together, uh, there, there is this shift in our culture where some people are saying, I don't need to actually go to church. I can just watch on the live stream. And we're excited and, and like privileged to be in a time where we have the ability to stream services live, which we have right now, probably some people viewing online. But I wanna just encourage, especially for a moment, those watching online, if you guys uh, are in a different city, we have streamers watching in different places, I wanna encourage you to find a local church that like this could be supplemental, but this cannot be your community just coming and watching me on Sunday morning. So I wanna just encourage the live streamers and for some of the, you guys here as well who may live stream at home, um, it's great for like having the ability to break down barriers, to have a live stream, to be able to reach new people who might be scared to come to church, but community doesn't happen when you're just live streaming in your living room. And there's a lot of people I've met who even some I grew up in church with and they're like, yeah, I don't go to church anymore. I just watch like these sermons on YouTube. And like, th we, we think that now we're, we're getting filled in that way. But again, we're, we're lacking what true community actually looks like. And so um, I wanna just, uh, I wanna say that today we're gonna, we're gonna look at what the church looked like and what community looked like, especially even in the first century. And what I believe is as we're seeing the shift away from community more so into individualism and escapism, I think what's needed most in our community isn't so much like a large gathering of people like what we do here every single week. Um, it's great, and I hope it's supplemental. I hope it's helpful for you. But I think what's most needed is small communities of people, like we've seen 30, 40 years ago growing up, just communities of people who open up their homes and open up their lives for people uh, because there's every single person, like growing up in this generation, is looking for a sense of belonging. They're looking for true and authentic community, and they're trying to find it in their screens. They're trying to find it in their phones. But I just believe that the time is ripe for us as followers of Jesus to present to the world world, uh, a community that looks radically different than the type of community that's being constructed by the social structures of our society today. And so I want to just encourage us that I believe that this is the time where God's calling the church to be the church. I believe he's calling us as a church not to just go to church, but to actually be it and to live on mission in our neighborhoods and to live as a people who actually practices community. Now, I did want to, before we jump into the text, give, um, and there's probably a million of these, but as we're talking about community and rolling out small groups and opening our lives and neighboring and hospitality and all that type of stuff. Um, I, I know for myself, these are a few of my primary objections, the things that m would make it difficult for me to actually step in and be a part of this. And so these may resonate with some of you guys as well. I think that these may be the two main reasons that people don't actually practice community, don't actually open their homes, or maybe are scared to go to somebody's homes and, and actually live a lifestyle of community that we see Jesus invites us into. Two main hindrances or maybe main reasons reasons why you may be afraid to do that um, or choose not to do that. The first one, I think is number one would be just too busy. I think that this is probably the, the number one excuse most people would use or make as to why they're not a part of a community, why they don't live in community, why maybe you wouldn't join a story group. It's just too busy, right? It seems like every single person today is too busy. We are like life right now, the pace at which life is moving is a million miles an hour. And to think of just another thing I try to fit into my week while I'm trying to do life with other people, it's like, man, I got so much homework. I got too 
much, uh, too many hours on the clock that I got to work. Maybe I'm working for home. Maybe, man, how am I going to do that with the kids? How am I going to fit my sports and my kids' sports and my activities? How am I going to fit another thing in, right? We're too busy. And the reality is we are all very busy. Like every, like today, they're, like if you're just chilling on your parents' you know, couch all day and doing nothing, like you are the exception to the rule now. Like people are uh, out grinding. That's the reality. But I just don't think that being too busy is a good enough excuse for saying I'm going to neglect this because the reality is we all have time. We all have 24 hours in a day. God's given all of us equal time. It's what we choose to invest in. And I know, like, I'm not going to do this, but you can go home later if you want, and you can get on your iPhone, and you can click on general, and you can click on screen time. Just look at how much time you spend on your phone a day. You would be embarrassed at yourself. I know that because I'm embarrassed at myself, right? Mine right now is at three hours, 14 minutes a day. I just looked at it this morning, and I'm like, dude, that's wild. How am I on my phone three hours a day? Some of y'all are probably on at six or nine. I'm just saying, slow down, right? So to say you're too busy, it's not a good enough excuse. Like we, yeah, we're too busy on our phones. We're too busy watching. Like we're busy with those things. I don't think that we can actually justify that, you know, community is something I can't do just because I have too much on my plate. Jesus, I can guarantee it was more busy than any single one of us. And Jesus chose to prioritize community. To prioritize this, there may be certain things that need to be cut out. There may be certain things that you need to limit. And so, you know what? I'm gonna let go of this so that I can actually do this so that I can actually be in community. So too busy, I think, is one reason we, um, we stay away from community. The second one I would say would, would probably be a combination of what I would call either pride or perfectionism pride or perfectionism. Many people don't want to open their homes um, and, and create a space of community to welcome people simply because they don't feel like their home is nice enough or because they don't feel like it's clean enough or they don't feel like the furniture is cool enough or they don't think they can make food that tastes good enough. Like we are living in a Pinterest world, right? We're like a, 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 a comparison generation where you think to facilitate community like, oh no, like my house has to look like that house on Pinterest or my house has to look like that celebs house who has millions of followers. It's like so perfect, right? And I, I, I get that. Like I get where you're coming from. We just remodeled our kitchen like six months ago and we still haven't got the backsplash done. It's so ugly. I ripped off the old blue tiles and now there's all this like glue on the wall. But me and my wife have been debating. She wants white backsplash. I want gold. And so we've been going back and forth. And legitimately, I haven't want, like I was like, I was scared to have people over because I was like, dude, like the kitchen's so ugly. Like the cabinets look lies nice, but the backsplash just sucks. I don't want people to see that. And I realized like, this is me. Like, I want to wait for it to be perfect to have people over. And this is all of us. Like, this is the generation we're growing up in is we want to have this kind of facade of perfection. But again, community has nothing to do with impressing people. This is, again, we live in a generation that just seeks and longs for the approval of people. Community isn't how can I impress people? It's how can I serve people? How can I make people feel welcomed? If somebody comes into your house and you don't have your backsplash done or you haven't remodeled your bathroom or your couch isn't as cool as someone else's. People genuinely don't care about that if they're coming for the right reasons. If they're coming to just build relationships, to actually get to know you, to share life together, those things don't really matter. And so again, there's this pressure because of the age of social media and Etsy and Pinterest and all these things. There's this, there's this bubble of perfection, perceived perfection that we feel we need to fulfill before we can actually open up our homes or open up our lives to people. And I wanna just encourage you if you're here today and maybe you're struggling with that. Maybe you're like, yeah, man, like that's kind of me. Like that's kind of why I have a hard time with this. I think if we actively stop trying to achieve perfection as the goal before we invited people into our lives and invited people into our homes, I believe that those people would actually be able to connect with us on a deeper level rather than feeling like now, like I have to achieve that standard as well. Like the, the, we, we do this to each other. We, we, we live by this certain standard of perfection and then people come over and now they think they have to do that as well. If we just say, hey, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the house is perfectly clean. You got kids running around. It's not supposed to be clean. They're gonna make a mess, right? You don't have to live in this perceived idea of perfection. And I think if we just kind of lower the standard of that a little bit and just say, hey, this is real life. Like I don't have a perfect house. I don't have a perfect environment to host community, but I do have a heart to just build relationships with people. People will sense that and they'll feel 
feel that and they'll realize that this is really the focus. The focus isn't about how great does this look and how great is the food and how perfectly manicured is everything. It's no, like it's real and it's raw and let's come together and just build those relationships. And so I wanna just encourage you um, to just think through and pray through maybe today, maybe this week, you know, what maybe are those fears or what are those insecurities or maybe the excuses that are keeping you from community? Because again, this is a cultural shift. Culture is changing and shifting and moving us more away from community, more towards individualism. What are the things for you that are maybe preventing you from saying, man, I, I really need this. I wanna be a part of something like this. I wanna start to have a space where I invite my neighbors over, where I invite people over, where maybe I lead a story group. What is it for you? What are the fears? What are the insecurities? What are the excuses that are keeping you from the type of community that Jesus actually wants to invite you into so that you can both be served by others and be loved by others as well as serve other people and love other people and use what Jesus has given you not just for yourself but as an opportunity for the gospel. So again, um, I wanna just encourage us to this week, maybe just think through those things. Man, what is it for me that makes it difficult? And uh, if you can identify those things, just take them to the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, help me to work through these things. Again, it's gonna be a journey and the journey is gonna look different for each of us, but if we can identify our fears or our insecurities around community, I think that that's the first step in moving in the right direction. Amen? Amen. So um, last week, um, we, we looked a little bit, at least if you were at the first service, we, we got about halfway through the teaching. Um, we looked a little bit at the Old Testament, how God's plan was that the gospel and the knowledge of God would spread through the earth, through the family. Um, we looked how this starting with Adam and Eve, that again, that the, the goal and the method in the Old Testament to bring people the revelation of God wasn't bring them to a church building on a Sunday morning. It was through the family in a household. It was God appointing families and commissioning them, hey, disciple your kids and love people and love your neighbors. So we saw last week in the Old Testament, at least partially, we didn't get all the way through it, that the family and the home was the primary place where ministry happened. You didn't see like this big Sunday thing like we have here. It was actually through the home and through the family. And today I wanna pick up in the New Testament and uh, I wanna show you that in the New Testament, the primary place where ministry happened and where people gathered was actually in the household, which is again, part of why we're making the shift. We're keeping Sunday morning as a supplement, but we're really hoping that ministry happens now house to house. And again, the whole New Testament, and some people don't, this is really important to get the context of the New Testament. If you don't get the context of it, some stuff just doesn't make sense. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that. But the entirety of the New Testament was written by apostles who were doing church in their house. And all of the letters were written to people who were doing churches in their house. Every single one of the letters of the New Testament. It wasn't like, like to the church of the story or the church of Ashland. It would not have been like what this is. Paul was writing these letters to people who opened their house and were inviting believers in and were reaching the lost in their communities. Every single letter in the New Testament. It was written to people doing church in the house. And here's a few examples of that. We can start, again, I had you open to uh, Romans chapter 16. Starting in verse three, look what Paul the apostle writes here. Again, he says, uh, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also, verse five, the church in their house. Greet my beloved uh, Epiphanes, I don't know how to say that, who was for, uh, the first convert to Christ in Asia. So Romans here, Paul says, hey, to the church that is in Prisca and Aquila's house. I want you to give greetings to them. Again, the church that Paul is writing to was in the house of these individuals. It wasn't this big, cool building. It was literally somebody's living room and Paul is writing to encourage them. Colossians chapter four, verse 15. Or if you're a note taker, you can write that down. Paul says this, he said, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. So Paul is saying, hey, in Laodicea, there's this church in Nympha's house and I want you to simply give greetings to her. It was just in somebody's living room. Just this random lady, we don't know anything else other than her name is Nympha and she had a church in her house and Paul says, hey, I wanna encourage you guys. Open this letter, read the letter, study it together, the church meeting in her living room. If you track the proclamation of the gospel in the book of Acts, I mean, you could do a whole sermon on this, but I 
I just want to give you the brief rundown. Acts chapter 16, you see that there was a church that was planted in Philippi, and that was in Lydia's house. You see the next chapter, Acts 17, that uh, Paul goes on a missionary journey to Thessalonica, and there's a church in this man by the name of Jason's house in Thessalonica. You see chapter 18, the church of Corinth that was meeting in Justice's house. Again, all these churches in the New Testament, it was just a random guy or a random lady's living room. And that's where the churches were, and that's where Paul was on his missionary journey. He was traveling. He was showing up at the church, which was their living room, and he was just sharing the gospel with those people and encouraging the saints in the work of the ministry. Now, again, I said the whole context of the New Testament, this is the context that church was happening in people's living rooms. And I want you to see, again, how if we miss that context, some stuff just doesn't really make sense. I want you to flip over real quick to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul is writing to the church of Corinth and he's giving instruction for what a worship service is to look like. When, when the God's people gather together, what's supposed to happen? What are we supposed to do? What's it supposed to look like? And here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. He says, what then, brothers, when you come together, he says, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. So Paul says, when the church comes together in Corinth, he says, every single one of you, when you come together, someone has a hymn, someone has a lesson, somebody has a revelation, someone has a tongue, someone has an interpretation. He says, each one of you, when you come together, has a gift that you're gonna use. Now again, uh, what's important here is that this verse it does not make sense in the way that we do church in our culture because this letter was not written to a group of two or 300 people in a large room on a Sunday morning in a church building. This letter was written to people who were meeting in their living room. It was a small group of people. We can't actually do what Paul says is supposed to happen when the church gathers the way that we do church today. Like, could you imagine this? This is what worship service is supposed to look like. He says, every single one of you comes and someone has a hymn, someone has a lesson, but each one of you has a gift and let it be done for the building up. Like, could you think about that for a moment? If like, we just were like, okay, well, this we're supposed to do. We're starting in the back. What do you have? Okay, she sang a hymn. That's cool. What about you? And like every single person, we'd be here all week, right? So again, we can't even do this in the way that we practice church today because this was written to a church and a group of people who was meeting together in a living room in someone's house in Corinth. And so that makes sense. You got 10, you got 15 people, which is kind of the target number that we're going for as we roll out these small groups. Hey, we can do that. Let's just have everybody, let's go around real quick and everybody share just something God's been doing in your life or something you need prayer for or just encourage somebody or, or an answer to prayer that God's done that we can praise together. Wow, we can actually do that. We can actually, and it, and it wouldn't take that long to just give a few minutes for each person to bring something and to share something and encourage them. That's actually doable because that is the context in which this passage was written. I remember like wrestling with this verse for so long. I worked at three different churches before I planted my own. And I remember being like, man, like why? Uh, I was like, why don't we do this? Like why, how are we supposed to do this? And I remember asking my pastors like, you know, why don't we do this? And they're like, honestly, I, I don't know. Like the word says clearly everyone's supposed to do it, but we don't know how to do it. We didn't know how to do it because we missed the context that this actually can't happen like the way we do church today. It was intended to be for people coming together in a home church, which is what was happening here in Corinth. So again, for the first three years of Christianity, after Jesus' ascension, the house was the primary place of ministry. This was the place where people were getting saved. This was the, people were the place where people were getting discipled. This is what you see in the New Testament. It was churches being planted in people's homes. Now, I want to focus on one primary passage, which we've looked out a little bit in the past couple of weeks. It's Acts chapter 2, verse 40, starting in verse 42. So flip back there real quick. We've covered a lot of this extensively, but I think there's a little bit more for us here that I want to unpack. So Acts chapter 2, this, Jesus had just ascended into heaven, and this was what the early church looked like. Starting in verse 42, it says this. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. We covered that passage extensively, that one verse a couple weeks ago, that this is the foundational pillars for what the church was built on. It was the scriptures. It was fellowship, people coming together. It was breaking of bread, sharing a meal, separate, uh, 
celebrating the Lord's Supper and prayers, people praying together. So if you missed that teaching, it's on the podcast. You can go back and catch it. But these were the four pillars. And then he says, and awe, verse 43, came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now check this out. Here's what he says, verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as anyone had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So this is a picture of what the early church looked like here in the book of Acts. And what we see is that the early church did so much more than just attend a once a week Sunday morning gathering, come and sing a few songs and listen to some dude teach and then roll. Like they did so much more than that. And again, this, this has become what church is in Western culture. Church has become, that's what I do. I go to 9 a.m. or 11.15, I show up, I drink some coffee, I say what's up to some people, I sing some songs, I listen to that dude get up there and teach, and like, I, I, I did it. Like, I fulfilled my role as a Christian. This is where church has went. This is where uh, culturally, like, people assume, like, th- what it's supposed to look like. But again, what we see here in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, is that it was so much more. The community and the family and, and, and just what was taking place was such a beautiful thing. We miss out on so much of what God has because we've missed the heart of God for what community was supposed to look like. So I want to point four things out here. Um, The first one, and I'll just go through these real quick. In verse 44, we see that they were together in unity. Like, look at this. Verse 44, all who believed were together and they had all things in common. They were so unified that it didn't matter your social status, your education, whether you made six figures or you were making minimum wage. Like this, this family, when they came together, again, uh, gathering together, it says that they were, they were unified and they shared all things in common. It wasn't like, man, like I wanna be like him or I wanna be like her. It was just like, let's share like the things that we have that God's given us. Let's open them up one for another. So they were together in unity. We see secondly in verse 45 that they were together in generosity with all their possessions. Verse 45 says they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as anyone had need. Now, I do need to point out, contrary to how it may sound, this was not an early form of communism. Like it may, at first glance, you may read that and be like, whoa, like communism, maybe it is biblical, right? Uh, No, this gives giving was not compulsory. This wasn't forced. This isn't prescriptive saying this is what you have to do. This giving was actually voluntary. Like they they, they had such a love for the body of Christ, such a love for one another that they genuinely from the bottom of their heart voluntarily said, hey, man, you you lack and I have. I wanna wanna sell to help you. I wanna sell this to give to you. I wanna share what I have. There was such this generosity that it was just an overflow that people who had much and who had abundance, they were just giving to those who had less and were less fortunate and were in need. And this is the way that people's needs got met. It wasn't you went to the church office and filled out a benevolence form. It was the body of Christ, the family recognized, hey, you're in a hard time and we wanna help you and we wanna support you. It was such a cool thing. Again, not compulsory generosity, but it was voluntary. We see then number three also, that in verse 46, they were opening their homes to each other and again, sharing meals together. It says in verse 46, day by day, they were attending the temple. This was before the temple was destroyed. It was destroyed in AD 70. After that, there was no temple formal place like there was here. Uh, They were just attending the temple though, as we do, attending church Sunday, but also breaking bread in their homes. They received their their food with glad and generous hearts. So again, there's this balance here. It was like, yeah, hey, they were going to the temple, but also day by day, going into each other's homes and just sharing a meal together, breaking bread together, opening up their homes. Again, we talked about that. This is a foreign idea for us. We're, it's easy for us, go to temple if you would, go to church on Sunday morning. But the other piece of just on the daily, just inviting people over and sharing life and sharing a meal is lost in our culture today. And this is why, this is one of the, the primary practices of story groups is just gonna be sharing a meal together. 
like just to come and have food together and talk and do life together. Like that is a part of following Jesus. It's just coming together and having food. And that's what they did in the early church. Open their homes with glad and generous hearts. Come on over and let's cook a steak. And if you're a vegan, come on over and I'll cook you some kale, right? Like it's a win-win for everybody. Verse 47, we see here as well that they were together in praising God. And look, look what it says, verse 47. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. So again, they came together, not just opening homes, sharing meals, but praising God together. Hey, what's God doing in your life? What's God doing in your life? What do you need prayer for? How can we praise together? They were a family. They celebrated together. They praised, wow, God, thank you that you're able to meet these needs. Thank you that this person was willing to sell his pig so that this person could have a pig, right? Like, it was really cool. They were celebrating and praising God together. And it says they had favor with all people, which is really cool. Now, the question that I have for us in light of this, is simply this. Does this, what we read right here, verse 44, 45, 46, 47, together in unity, together in generosity and their possessions, opening their homes, sharing meals together, praising God together. My question is, does this sound like the church today? Like when you think of the church today, and I don't just mean the church you come to, the story, although that could be a part of it. Like the church at large, the body of Christ, does this sound like the church today? Is the church of Jesus Christ, are, are, are we unified? Are we a people who are generous with one another? Are we a people who are hospitable? Are we a people who have favor with all people? That's what it says that this is what the early church looked like. Is this what the church today looks like? Sadly, I think the answer is no. That this is probably when people think of the church today, Christians today, they probably don't think of these things. Oh yeah, they're so unified. They're so generous. They're so hospitable. And they have favor with the world. They have favor with culture. Sadly, this is not what the church look like, looks like today. Christians today and the church today, I would say is almost the exact opposite of what it looked like here. I think that the church today is more divided than ever. We are not unified. Like there is so much division, even among Christians, we're more divided than ever. I think in the church today that most Christians know very little of generosity. Again, we are so individual in our pursuits and my money is mine. And like the, the thought of being generous with people and actually helping somebody in need, like it is a very rare thing in our culture today, sadly, even among Christians. Like, I just like, I could get the next iPhone or I could help that dude pay his rent. iPhone, right? Like, that's the reality. That's where our culture's at. We do not know generosity. Christians today do not see their houses as a place to welcome and invite others to come and practice hospitality. Again, it's a place of escape. It's a place of isolation. It's not a place to bring other people. It's a place for me to escape from other people because they're all crazy and I need to get away, right? Like that's the way that we see our homes. The exact opposite of what they were doing in the early church. Christians today certainly, again, verse 47 says, they had favor with all the people. Christians today certainly do not have favor with all people. Especially like thinking about people who don't know Jesus. If you think about your friends and your coworkers and your family who don't know Jesus, most people who are not following Jesus want nothing to do with people who are following Jesus. We don't have favor with them. It's like the opposite. It's like, why would I want to be like you? Why would I want to go to church like you do? Why would I want to follow Jesus like you? There is zero favor amongst God's people today. So my question is, where have we gone wrong? Like if this is what the early church was, they were unified and they were generous and they were opening their homes and they were praising God together and had favor. But the church today looks the exact opposite, if we're honest. What, what happened? Like where did we go wrong? How have we gotten so far off course? Like what is it? What is it they had? What is it that they were doing that we're missing today? Because I just believe that there's something missing. What is it that has gotten us off course and if I could boil it down to three things, I would say these are the three main things. If you're a note taker, you could write these down if you want. Number one, church has become something we do. That is a weekly event. Here we are, I'm at church. Church has become something we do rather than a people we have been called to become. 
Again, we see church as, I went there Sunday morning, did it, I'm good to go. That's not what church is. Church is a people, a community who we have been called to become. I think because we've got the wrong definition of church, we have kind of gotten off course a little bit. Number two, Christianity and discipleship has become something I do alone rather than something that we do together in community. If you think about this, even your walk with the Lord, we say it's, it's just me and Jesus. It's my walk with the Lord. We have seen our walk with Jesus as just me and Jesus. And I don't need other people around me. I don't need to let them speak into my life. I've already got Jesus. Why would I need anybody else? So again, Christianity and discipleship has become something I do alone rather than something we do together. Again, look at the early church here. There's nothing that they were doing where it's just me and Jesus, just me and the Holy Spirit. It was always community-centered. And then number three, again, where I think we've gone wrong, is Jesus has become a personal savior rather than the savior of the world. Now again, both of these are true, but I think that we have overemphasized the personal nature of our salvation to the detriment of realizing that Jesus has saved us together as a community. Did he save me individually? Yes, absolutely. Did he save you individually? Yes, absolutely. But he saved you individually to bring you into something bigger, to bring you into a family, to bring you into community. And when I just think of my salvation as it's just me and Jesus, rather than he saved me into a family. He's brought me into the fold. There's other sheep in the flock. We kind of can get off track. And so in short, I think all of these, what all of these point to, missing the the heart of what the church is, not a place I go, but a people we're called to become, seeing Christianity not as something that I do by myself, but something we do together, and seeing my salvation not as just Jesus saved me personally, but he saved us corporately. In short, all of these are showing us ultimately that I think we have turned away from really the biblical practice of community. Like all of these things, whether it be our moment of salvation, whether it be our discipleship, whether it be how we view church, in short, we've completely just rejected and walked away from the biblical practice of community. And I believe that the only way forward for us as a church, for us as a people, for us as a family, is actually, in this case, to look backwards, I believe that we are not called to forage some sort of new path and try some sort of new creative stuff to figure out what we can do to create community. I believe that the call for us is simply to just return to the old path, the old path which has been tested, the old path which has been tried, the old path which remains true, and that path is the way of community. And the way of community is the way of Jesus. It's as simple as that. The church will continue to remain stagnant and we will fall miserably short of all that Christ has called us to unless we as the church begin to be the church and we as the church begin to follow Jesus together as one body in community. So again, the path forward is this. It's just looking back, wow, look what they had. Look what they did. It was an authentic community, loving each other, praying for each other, serving one another, helping meet the needs of one another, opening their homes to one another, sharing meals with one another. Not anything revolutionary, something really simple that actually any one of us could do, which is what's so amazing about this. It doesn't take some sort of theological degree to be able to do this. It's just opening your life and loving people and doing life together. Like, it's so cool that all these people in the church who uh, Paul writes these letters to who had churches in their home, they're just random people. Like, we don't even really know anything about them, but they just opened their homes and said, hey, come on over and have a meal and let's pray together and do life together. I believe that that is the way forward. And I believe that this is something that Christ has called us to. And the, the amazing thing is that we don't just need this for us. Like community is not only for us and for our sake, but it's also for the sake of the world. It's so that other people who are isolated and who are, who are growing up in a culture that places individualism and autonomy at the top values list, that they can see a different way and that that different way would be something that points them to Jesus. Because look what happens in verse 47. At the very end of Acts chapter two, it says they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And look at the result of this. He says, and the Lord added to their number Day by day, those who were being saved. So check this out. 
The result of the early church being together in unity, the result of the early church opening their lives with generosity, the result of the early church practicing hospitality and opening their homes and sharing meals is that the Lord added day by day those who were being saved. Every single day, people were coming to know Jesus. Not because a big group of people went to a synagogue service on Sunday, but because day by day, people were just opening their homes and opening their lives to people and people were coming into the kingdom. If you look at the the church growth through the book of Acts, it is today still the most unmatched revival in the history of the world. How quickly the early church grew, partially because of these things, it's unmatchable. In Acts 1, the church grew from 12 disciples to 120. In Acts 2, the church grew from 120 to 3,000. In Acts 4, the church grew to 5,000. Just go through the book of Acts. You're going to track it over and over. Like literally thousands of people all the time coming to know Jesus. And this was the result of biblical community, that people actually came to know Jesus. And again, this, this wasn't, hey, come to this service with me Sunday. It was, come to my house. It was, let me make you a meal. It was, how can I serve you? It was, what do you need? What do I have that I can give to you? This was bringing salvation to people day by day. And so again, community is essential for the outworking of God's plan, not just for our lives, but it's essential for the outworking of God's plan to reach the world. The reality is that when we properly image our creator in community, when we love one another wholeheartedly, when we serve each other generously, when we invite people into our homes and practice hospitality, the world actually sees a living picture of the gospel because all of these things, these are what Jesus did for us. This isn't just like do this for the sake of this. This is a picture of the gospel. Living in community, serving people, laying down our lives. Like this is what Jesus himself modeled. He's not calling us to do something new. He's just saying, look at what I've done. That the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and gave his life a ransom for many. That the son of man came and loved people, even sinners, people who were far from. He came and he loved them and he served them. So again, this is a practical demonstration for how people see what is different and what is unique about the church of Jesus Christ. What is different and what is unique about disciples of Jesus and followers of Jesus. And again, sadly, right now when people look at Christians, there's not really anything unique. There's not really anything different. We're doing the same things that everything in the world does. We're pursuing the same things that the culture pursues. There is no difference. And I believe the difference that we have been called to is simply this, a lifestyle of community, a lifestyle of serving each other, of loving one another, just as Christ has done for us. Again, this is why day by day people were being saved is because people were actually attracted to Christians. They were like, wait, what? Like, I don't know Jesus, but I needed a place to stay and you opened up your house or I didn't have a meal and you opened up your table to come. Like, wow, and people came to know Jesus. So again, day by day, this was taking place. I believe that when we as the church understand that church isn't what we do here Sunday morning, church is who we've called to be throughout the week as we go out there, that we're gonna see more people come to know Jesus. We often wait for God to add to the church on Sundays. We're like, man, I invited my friend. I hope he comes and I hope he hears the gospel. I think God is waiting for us to take his kingdom out there. Like not bring people just here on Sundays, but allow his kingdom to go and break into people's lives out there as we practice hospitality and serve people and open our homes. And this is the reason that we're doing this, guys. Like the reason that we're starting these uh, story groups and opening up our homes isn't just because, well, this is what the early church did, so maybe we should try it. We really believe that this is something Jesus is calling us to do to further and advance his kingdom in our lives and in our communities. Like, we believe that this is a way that God is gonna bring people into his kingdom. We believe that this is a way that God is gonna call prodigals back, that God is gonna bring people into his fold is not through just coming here on a Sunday, but through just opening our homes and our lives to one another. And again, this is, this is 
so countercultural to, to where we're at. I know that this is hard and a new journey for some people. And um, I understand that for most of our lives, we have seen a Sunday morning building as a place of worship. I, we have not seen typically our homes as a place of worship and ministry. But I believe that as we begin to make a pivot here and as we begin to change the cultural narrative and say, you know what? Ministry shouldn't just happen here Sunday mornings. It can happen in my life every day. And it can happen in my house throughout the week. I believe that as we begin to make this shift, that we're gonna see people who would maybe never even set foot in a church building coming to know Jesus just because of the way that we practice hospitality and love and serve and actively demonstrate what Christ did for us for them. And so that's why this is so important. And so I wanna just close with just asking maybe this question. The question being, what is it that's holding you back from embracing the community that Jesus has for you? Like, what might it be? What, what are those hindrances? What's holding you back there from saying, man, I can do this. I, I, I could love people. I could serve people. I could meet the needs of people. I could use what Jesus has given me for others. Like, what is it that's holding you back? Is it uh, maybe for some people the, the fear of rejection? Is it for some people maybe an insecurity? Is it maybe the discomfort that comes with maybe opening up your home to people you don't know? Is it maybe that Christianity for you has always been about consumerism and it's just you get your needs met rather than contribution and, and serving to meet the needs of others? For each person, it might be different, but I really wanna encourage us this week to just pray through what is it that's holding me back from, from embracing this vision that Jesus has for my life, a, a life of community. Not just me and Jesus, but us together, following Jesus together, doing life together, sharing meals together, praying together, celebrating together. What is it that's holding us back? And my hope and my prayer for us is that we could today be able to identify those things and say, Jesus, I'm bringing those things to the cross. I'm trusting that you have finished those and that this is what you're calling me into. 